Welcome to the GCN Tech Show. This week, we're discussing why teams that have one all-round bike, such as a tarmac, are at a disadvantage to teams that have a dedicated climbing bike and aero bike, such as Visma, with their Cervelos. We're also going to be discussing a new factor bike, the crazy expensive Envy handlebar, how Bromptons have gone 12 speed. We're also going to take a look at that crazy looking POC helmet, as well as the Bike Vault and Comments of the Week. Let's go. Um, Alex is back from Tour Down Under. I've got you some presents, mate. Oh, thanks. I've got you these. <laughs> I haven't got you any camelback. presents. That's all right. <laughs> I've got you these camelback uh, covers. I've been using these. They're like um, nozzles, the covers that go over your nozzle. So when you're riding out now, it stops the dirt getting on your bottles and making good. a wheel. Good, I like it. They're good. Health and, and safety first. And Cy was really underwhelmed by this last week. I thought it was really cool. I'm well, I watched the show. I am definitely. I'm buzzing for this actually. Oil slick design. This is actually you love incredible. Oil slick. Yeah, this is going to go straight on my Pinarello. lightweight alloy mech hanger for your Pinarello. I watched the show. Why was so Sai so underwhelmed about it? I think it's cool. Anyway, um, this week we are discussing, like Ollie said at the start of the show, are teams with one bike at a disadvantage compared to teams with two different bikes. Also, I've kind of got some of my own thoughts about the world tour bikes, yeah. which I'll share, but. You kind of like, you kick us off a little bit. Well, I watched your video from, you know, the hot tech at the at the Tour Down mm -hmm. Under. Thanks. Luke Plapp's bike stood out to me. Oh, it was good Because it's that about. new, the new Propel. Yeah. The paint job on it looks wicked. Well, he's also got an Australian National Champs version as well. Which yeah. Is bloody cool. But they've gone down the route of, with the giant Propel. It used to be that they had a really, it was like a full-on aero bike, and then they had the TCR, which is like more round tubes with yeah. more climbing bike. The new Propel looks like a kind of aero TCR. Do you yeah, know what I mean? I, yeah, I do know what you mean. I feel like, well, you know already, but there are certain brands that have gone down this route mm -hmm. and there's certain brands that have kind of really steered in the opposite direction. I mean, one of those being Orbea with the sponsorship of Lotto Destiny. They've yeah. gone, well, we've got an aero road bike, which is basically a time trial bike with drop handlebars, or we've got the Oracle, which is like traditional kind of geometry, we've made it as light and climby as possible. Yeah, and you've got the Canyon-sponsored teams. Um, so you look at Alpecin de Kearney, yeah. you know, you've got the Ultimate, you've got the Air Road, pretty polarised um, designs, and then you've yeah. got the, you know, Cervelo with the R5 and the S5 yeah. for, for Visma. Um, and typically between the difference in, in these bikes, you're looking at, you know, the lightweight one is usually on the on the UCI weight limit. And yeah. are able to build that. So in the case of the Ultimate, the Canyon, yeah. you can build that on the UCI weight limit in the CFR yeah. model. But then the Air Road, you're looking at about half a kilo heavier than that. Yeah, most bikes are over the UCI weight limit now. Yeah. Um, and I think that is a really good point that, I think essentially for teams to get down to the lightest bike that they're allowed to have, You've kind of got to sacrifice aero, which feels like it's 2024. It yeah. feels crazy to say that we're having to sacrifice aero to get to the, the weight, which was set I mean, years ago. Yeah. Like, it feels like, how are we in this situation? But I mean, we are, so. Yeah. And then, you, so you go, well, what's the kind of difference in performance between those, between those bikes? Yeah. Different things. So there has been like independent tests done yeah. that look at like all, like all the sort of world tour frames. And when you when you sort of look at 45 kilometers an hour which is like industry standard industry standard one speed, thing that standard. most people have agreed yeah. on and it is also indicative of the pro peloton yeah the difference between like a top all rounder like a cannondale super 6 mm -hmm. or the um or the tarmac yeah. the s works tarmac and the full on aero bikes so things like the canyon air road yeah you're typically looking at a saving in the region of five to 10 watts faster for the aero bike. Okay. Um, which isn't much. I think no. people probably would think it may be more than that. Yeah, I guess so. But then you've got the trade off of the, the weight difference. Yeah, and well. I just want to stress that is like, that's coming from independent testing. So on the, on the flat, you're mm -hmm. looking at, um, and this is accounting for the fact that wheels can be the same. Yeah. Um, on the flat, you're, you know, if you say, if we model it in a 10 mile time trial, yeah. That five, if we just take it five watts, five watts is about six seconds at 45k an hour. And obviously the pros aren't racing 10 mile time trials all the time. So they're, I don't know, it's not unusual for a pro stage race or a one day race to be, give or take, 100 miles, say. Yeah, but 
you know, you'd say that for a pro, that is significant. Yeah. Because, it, you know, if you're, if you're going six to 10 seconds just in your bike over 10 miles or 16 kilometers, yeah. that is the difference between either catching the brake or yeah. not catching the brake or the brake staying away or, or not well, being caught. I think caught. of like the longest one day race, Milan San Remo, I think. So people win and lose by like, a couple of centimetres in a sprint, yeah. and at the same time, it, yeah, in, in yeah, when you win by a tyre's width in the yeah. in the sprint, again, that aero bike versus if the other guy's not on an aero bike, that's actually the difference between winning and losing. And this isn't this isn't marketing; it's just that that it is. But but not obviously the rest of us don't necessarily need that absolute. You know, five watts isn't as important. It's not like crucial when you ride as a cafe. But for for, for pro athletes, yeah. where the winning margins are so small you know, you'd say it's significant. But what about when we start to introduce like slower speeds and climb into this? I think it's important to address that as well. Yeah, right? so when, you know, we can model that as well. And when you look at the at, at climbing, yes, the aerodynamics of the bikes, even for pros, becomes a lot less significant. Yeah. And it, it basically comes down to that sort of weight difference. And y you start to see, well, like, for you know, if we take like a sixty-eight kilometer, a sixty-eight kilogram professional rider, yeah, and then model them on you know Alpe d'Huez, a okay. typical speed or power output that they would do, you see that five hundred grams is worth around you know twelve seconds. Okay. So the difference in weight between the bikes. Yeah. Now, you you, you can claw some of that back on shallow climbs. Which is something that's been said before, you know, because of the, the speed at which they will yeah. go up on a climb that's, say, 4%, 5% average, they're clawing that back because the air is still to, significant. Um, like you saying, I seem to remember Josh Portner saying, typically you could say, like, the 7% gradient mark was where things start to switch over a little bit. Yeah. So, yeah, that's typically what you see at the pro speeds because yeah. the aero is still significant at... I mean, they're going a lot faster. Yeah, yeah, you know, well over, you know, approaching 30 kilometers an hour, you know, on, on, on climbs. Alpe d'Huez is steeper, and so we're going more off just the weight. Uh, so, yeah, 12 seconds. But again, 12 seconds. Yeah. Especially but, if there's a time bonus at the top. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's, that's, that's so in, significant. But this is obviously in, like, the pro world, right? We're talking about pro races. But I think... If there's an argument that outside of the pro world, people could maybe benefit from just having that one bike. Because, yeah. you know, like, if you're, your average person isn't going to go to the bike shop and buy the lightweight bike and the aero bike, they've kind of got to make that decision. And mm. I feel like it's almost pl them playing it safe to go, if I get the one in the middle, it covers all basis. Yeah. I, but yeah. Then, but then, well, one thing I just want to point out is that, so... <laughs> You know, although we're saying that 500 grams makes 12 seconds difference yeah. for a pro on Alpe d'Huez, yeah. five watts makes 29 seconds difference. So, yeah, okay. So just get that in perspective. Before you start saying that, you know, we're, you know, trying to just market stuff or whatever, we're part <laughs> yeah. of the big, you know, cabal. Yeah, <laughs> like, no. like, just if you ride five watts faster on average up Alpe d'Huez, you will be faster than if you... Yeah, you know, spend it's, not out, it's not out of this world to think that you can get five watts faster relatively easily by like improving your fitness. Yeah. Um, but some bits I wanted to actually discuss, right, was, um, so I've seen all of the latest bikes that tore down under, <laughs> and I, I would briefly mention this to you the other day, is that we're starting to see more and more teams getting more and more elaborate with the paint jobs that they're doing, right? The, the colorways, the design and intricacy is going, like, way more elaborate than what we've ever seen, I think. That's yeah. fair to say, right? And now I think the reason behind this is because if you remove the fancy paint jobs, they're just like, I mean, they're nice bikes, they're cool, but there's nothing outstanding there anymore. Mm. All bikes are kind of starting to look very similar silhouettes and shapes, the technology's the same. It's like basically most World Tour teams are now just using Shimano. Campag's not in the World Tour anymore. SRAM are down to, what, four teams now? Someone will correct me if I'm wrong. But I just think... They're running out of ways to try and make stuff stand out and be different, which I think is a shame. I think we need to, this whole thing needs to be shaken up, I think. Yeah. It's, yeah. I don't know the answer to it, but bike, I think that's what's A lot happening. of bikes are starting to look, look the same, definitely. Yeah. But I think yeah, if, if you, if, you know, going back to like sort of modeling the, the time yeah. differences you uh -huh. can make on the, on the two different types of bikes, you know, if you've got, say, I don't know, like a De Koenig rider, yeah. who can then have the, the um, aero bike on a, on a flat stage 
and and then switch. They, they've got like on a flat stage or a sprint stage, they've got that five to ten watt advantage. Yeah. But then as soon as they go into the mountains, they can hit. They they can get a, a six point eight kilogram bike that still has like aero wheels on it, you know, 45 mil wheels well, or something. And still optimised tube shapes, it's just not as aero. Yeah. yeah. Then, you know, on, on, a, on a day where there's a summit finish and, or steep climbs, you know, the, the, there's an advantage on each day and they're saving a bit of energy, a bit more energy each day, even if they're not winning yeah. that stage. It you know, they're, they're, the amount of total, you know, kilojoules that they're burning each day is just that bit less. Well, Anover's a grand tour, of course. That's going to add up significantly. You know, their training stress is just less. Well, their, their riding stress. Yeah. They're not training, they're racing. <laughs> but, like, you know what I mean. Yeah. The I've got a sort of, ca- not like a caveat, or I don't know what it is. Something I want to add into the mix there is, whilst I'm in complete agreement with what you're saying, you can't argue with the fact that switching between bikes is a good thing to have. I think there is, um, I don't want to say a minority, but a proportion of riders that are just choosing to use one bike and not going to switch between. Like, mm. like, I think bike riders and professional athletes are very much like stuck in their ways. And even if you presented an aero bike and a lightweight bike to a rider and go, like, here's one you should use for this day, here's one for another day. Do you know what? I think while some people are going to get behind that, some of them are going to go, I want to use that bike and I just... I just want to know that that's the one I like and that's the one I ride. Okay. They're not necessarily always going to yeah. take advantage of that. Well, yeah. there's two things there. Like, I think the, the bike brand that's sponsoring the team mm. needs to recognise that and then they need to basically make sure that the position can be perfectly replicated on both yeah, bikes. Yeah, totally. So a good thing to do is to just have the exact same geometry on both bikes. Yeah. It's just the different tube shapes. So I'm pretty sure that's what Cervelo have done. Makes sense. And so as a result, that's why you do see the Yumbo riders, because they also, they're, I mean, they're, well, I keep calling them Yumbo, Visma. <laughs> I, I didn't even Visma, notice, Lisa yeah. Bike, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're, you know, they're so on it with, with, with everything they're doing and they're thinking yeah. about all this stuff. You do see their riders routinely switching yeah. on different days in a Grand Tour between the aero bike and the, the, you know, the S5. I the think out of all the teams at the moment, they're for sure like paving the way for others to follow, even with being a bit bolder and like starting to chuck one bike into the mix again. Yeah. Because I feel like people tried, got scared, Yumbo, like, well, we're back on it again. Like, yeah. I think they're like pushing the boundaries of innovation and like educating riders on it and going, well, here, like, this is what's best, this is what's best. And then they're far more open to the conversation rather than, I don't know, like the traditional method of thinking and go, this is what you're using. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> so. I also just thought, you know, well, let's have a look at like the the, the winning stats and yeah, see if we can see into this. But like, yeah. when you look at the the wins from last year, the number one team was Jumbo Visma. Now Visma Lisa Bank. Yeah. Um, by by an absolute mile. I mean, everyone would have guessed that. You know, they won yeah. all the Grand Tours. You know, and they had two bikes. But if you look at the next three teams. So, who's that? We've got UAE, Quickstep and Ineos. They're just down to one bike. They're all using one bike. Yeah. So, it's very hard. You can't read much into it. And then after that, you know, you, you've then got uh, Alps and Koenig, uh, Lidl, Trek and yeah. EF. And they all have two bikes. So, it's very hard to draw conclusions looking yeah. from the stats in that way without performing a very complicated statistical analysis that takes into account <laughs> yeah. all the different riders and the abilities of those riders. I'm going to throw it out there. We're not going to conduct that study. No. Uh, <laughs> however, um, Alpsin did dominate sprints. Uh, yeah. In, you know, especially in the Tour, and they have that dedicated aero bike option. I think it might be Jasper Philipson that was one of the key well, elements. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think it's really it's an interesting like But then you go point of conversation. You go like quick step, didn't do as well in sprints yeah. as they would have liked by their normal high standards. What we can kind of be certain of though is that as a consumer, the all round bike is kind of like ideal, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Well I think it's giving people the option of not having to go out and just go do I need to decide between the aero bike or the lightweight bike? Because as much as we'd perhaps like to have both, it's not really practical, is it? Yeah, most people aren't getting two top-end bikes, are they? Like, <laughs> no. I, you know, personally, I, I'm I'm a fan of the all-rounder that uh, thing, and if if I could own, you know, if I was buying one bike and I could only have one bike, yeah, that is 100% what I would go for. The all-rounder, um, and I think other people think that way too, and that's why. You know they are those all-rounder models are really really successful. You know yeah. a lot of people buy them, and you know I I think 
essentially that is what the, the racing and the pros exist for, is to sell those bikes. Yeah, no, that's really true. I'm of the same mindset. As much as it would be great to be able to have the two different bikes you want, bike prices are absolutely ludicrous. You can't just keep buying bikes. You, you're governed by what you're happy to spend, yeah. basically. And, um, and I think, like, one thing we should do, though, is to stop categorising bikes as just aero or lightweight. I mean, and, and just have... I think it's three categories. I think it's aero, all-rounder. And lightweight. Yeah, oh, it's a new sector. Yeah. A new sector. Oh, there is though. I think like when you when you look at the the aero test data, you see that there are there is that like middle ground. Well, basically, we just it's as an, you would expect. There's an easy solution to this. Somewhere, somehow, someone just needs to make a really aero bike that is 6.8 kilos. Job done. There's your one bike to rule them all. Would it, how comfortable would it be though? What's the tyre clearance on it? Oh, I don't know. I haven't thought this through. Um, anyway, yeah, let's turn the comments. <laughs> right, job done with that. It's now time for Hot and Spicy Tech. We're kicking things off with this um, somewhat wildly prized Envy handlebar. Is that right? Those Envy handlebars. They caused quite a stir last week when they started appearing in the news. Yeah. Um, they're called the AR1. $1,300 or £1,200 a pair, which is ludicrous. That, yeah. You know, with all this stuff, like, this is the thing. People, you know, a lot of people, we know, we're reading the room, right? <laughs> a, lot of pe a lot of people are, are not happy with the price of things at the moment. No. Right? Yeah, I'm Cost aware of, of that. Prices. I'm aware of that. Yeah? Yeah. I know you are. You are. <laughs> but but, but, but this, is, this is ridiculous. To the point of, like, we, you, you, can, you could buy... A couple of bikes. A co well, I bought a bike... Last week, for 450 quid, brand new. But it didn't have the MV handlebar on it, did no, it? No, it didn't, but it was a whole bike. <laughs> so, right, I think we should clear something up here because I don't think in any way people can maybe question that they're like, the bar's doing all the fancy stuff that it says it's doing, but it does seem kind of crazy to think that that's the price tag that's attached to it, right? I think it is. Uh, it's so high that I actually think this, this must be a marketing stunt. <laughs> it must be like when we discuss that. If we that price this ridiculously like priced, it will outrage people. They've read yeah. the room as well, but they've come to a different. They've, they've cleverly thought <laughs> if we if we Go price high. this ridiculously, yeah, everyone's annoyed about things costing so much right now. It's all perfect. This will make the news, yeah, and then we'll get loads of publicity and exposure. In which well, case, we've fallen for it. Well, here we are talking about there it. There we go. It's worked. <laughs> um, so I've got some of the stats here about the bar. So it's available in a thirty-eight through to forty-six. That's like hood-to-hood -hood measurements. Um, loads of choice when it comes to stem length, going from ninety mil all the way to one hundred and forty in ten mil increments as standard. However, get this right: five mil increments can be ordered upon request. I haven't got information whether that's going to be an additional surplus. An additional charge. thousand pounds. Um, yeah, so it depends on the exact combination. You're looking at a weight of 330, 360 grams, which is it's very light for well, an integrated it's, it's competitive. Yeah, but you know, um, for that price, I'd want it to be the lightest and the stiffest. I'd want it to ride the bloody bike for me. I'd yeah, the auto steer. Yeah. Um, um, Pock Someone, helmet. Someone's going to buy it though, aren't they? But anyway, Pock, the Pock helmet. Let's move on. Pock helmet. So you saw a new Pock helmet at the Tour Down Under. Well, it didn't really like. I didn't get a good view of it, if I'm honest. Like we actually were chatting, and Sai messaged me as well whilst I was of in course Australia. He, did. he loves Pock. Yeah, Sai was glasses. like, get, get, have a look at this new Pock <laughs> helmet." And I was like, "Look, I can't see it anywhere." So we're going to discuss it now. Um, the EF rider has been using it on road stages. And it has a visor, right? It's got a visor. We've discussed the cask uh, modified helmet with the like ear flaps, and I feel like this is taking it to another level. Um, I, I kind of like lost for words for how does it explain it really? Because it's got a, it's like an aero road helmet with a visor clipped onto the front of it, and it feels like the bits on the sides, the little ear wings, are also like yeah. an afterthought that are clipped on the side. So when we have like. I mean, road helmets with visors aren't a new thing. They've been around for a long time. No. There's a lot of different brands making You could buy a, you buy a road helmet with a visor on from Amazon for 20 quid. But the thing is, though, is when you... Oh, I just... Mm. It's too much for me, I've got to be honest. I think it's, it's merging time trial equipment into road racing too much. I get it that everyone's out searching for these marginal gains, and when you are racing, if someone tells you this is going to save you 20 seconds, you'd be like, 
Mm, I'll take that. Do you know, I mean, I, I, I have never gone there. I think my own vanity would always step in and go, sunglasses look better, I'd rather wear just sunglasses. Yeah. Um, I do know that uh, back in the day, back in like, you know, Yesterday, this is a long time ago. Yeah. We were doing our first ever like road race as well. Bigham did used to race in a visor. Yeah, I just think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there we'll find go. out if it stands the test of time. Now that we've got two brands on board with that type of design helmet, maybe I was all following. Everyone going to start wearing maybe visors? It'll, maybe it'll become normalised. I kind of hope not, but I get the I get the technology. Right. So New factor Ostro van again. Spot this. Tour down under. Tour down under. Um, let me give you some of the brief headline stats about it. So, revised frame, we're talking about improvements in aerodynamics mostly. So it looks really cool. It is really cool. So if you watch the Hot Tech video, we saw the Israel Premier Tech painted up version and the Human Powered Health version. Cooler colour, this is Human Powered Health, way more vibrant. Anyway, so if we're looking at the head tube in front on, it's a way like drawn in, like hourglass kind of shape, yeah. which flows onto like the fork as well. They've tried to They've just revised all the shapes, basically, trying yeah. to make it a little bit more aero. And when I was chatting to the, um, the factor dude on the stand, they were saying it. I think it was, didn't say the exact like, speed, but uh, like maybe the industry standard 45k an hour, it was saving 10 watts. So that's partly the revision at the front. And then there's some differences at the back, like the curved in seat stay with the rear wheel drawn in a little bit. And also the um, like real sleek seat tube design. Yeah. Kind of, you know like when Pinarello released the new F, they went narrow seat tube, removed the battery out of it to make it skinny, put it down at the bottom. But it's interesting, That's isn't it? When that you, principle. When, when you look at like, I think it's always like say this, with, like people don't under, like respect, I think, the Pinarello and how clever that bike is in terms of a lot of the features get copied by a lot of other brands. Yeah, They okay, all yeah. lead the way. Like that, the way on like the F12 and the F that the, the head tube does hourglass yeah. in. People think, oh, it's just like organic lines to make it look more like... Someone has thought about it and it, tested it's it. At, yeah. it's, it's doing a lot more. Like yeah. the way that the seat stay junction is not all in the same point. It's like the seat stays are recessed back from where the seat tube is. It's like a deliberate little... It's all small features. details. And I guess, the, I guess the truth behind it is these are the small details that cost a lot of bloody money to implement. Yeah. Which is it's unfortunate. Also, um, had some new black ink wheels with that as well. Yeah, I spotted the. Um, they look really cool because they had like the. They have like the white logos on, and this is something <laughs> that's disappeared. Is you used to always get like wheels with white logos on that really like popped. They really pop, out. but then now it's kind of like pro only. Yeah, like the, the visions do it. The envies do it. These black ink wheels do yeah. it. Yeah, and now when if you buy some for yourself, like as a consumer. You get like the stealth graphics, yeah. But I, I like the white logos that pop. I mean, they do it yeah. for brand sponsor visibility on TV. Yeah, yeah. But I think they. I always think it looks really cool. Uh, well, in addition to the stickers, <laughs> there are new um, revisions to those wheels. They're essentially like three hundred grams lighter, which is like a significant amount on a wheel set. Um, yeah. So anyway, talk to me more about Brompton going 12 speed. Yeah, um, this week we've seen the news that Brompton have launched 12 speed bikes across their range. So on their little e-bike Bromptons and yeah. the super light titanium one they do top of the range and just the, the normal one. And this, I, I think this is, this is great news. So they've just got expanded gear range. So um, three speed internal hub and a four speed derailleur, which is giving you your three times yeah, four. Yeah, Sturmey Archer yeah. internal hub gears on there. Um, yeah, so the reason why this is really good is I just think Bromptons are brilliant. They're a fantastic like urban transport solution. I'm a big fan of them. Um, and the Achilles heel of them has always, I guess, been the gear range. Yeah. Especially when we live in a place like Bath where it's super hilly. <laughs> yeah. You know, You're not riding a Brompton up some difficult. of the deep streets, yeah. are you? So, or maybe the new one you will. Yeah, maybe that's something that's um, a good And then thing. finally in Hot Tech this week, Lidl, Trek, have announced a partnership with an on-bike aero sensor. Yeah, now, it's called aero sensor. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, we've, Original. We've spoken about it on the... Uh, well, it does what it says on the yeah. team. We've, um, yeah, we've spoken about the aero sensor on, on, on the show before. Um, you know, this is interesting to see a bike team, a pro bike team, actually having a, a sponsorship with one of these sensors. And I think, you know, I mean, these they, they keep just sort of coming and going, these things, but none of them ever really seem to take off because they are so difficult to use. And I think it makes sense for a pro bike team to have them and use yeah. them. 
But you have to use them in a very controlled environment. You're basically going to have to take it to a, a velodrome and do your testing there. I think if you're going to go to that length, you might as well go the extra little bit and go to a wind tunnel. Is my sort of gut feel on this, but I know they're different. I know they're taking different approaches, but um, either way, I think it's cool to see a team using that equipment and trying to push the boundaries of what's possible. Yeah, uh, more hot tech next week. Time now for comments of the week. God knows what comments of the week we've got this week because you picked them out. Yeah, so this is on uh, your hot tech video. Uh, from the Troll Down Under. Oh, actually, Savage Pro. Um, why so many cool paint jobs this year? Answer, bike technology has plateaued. Basically <laughs> saying what you were saying. Yeah, yeah. I kind of feel partly in agreement with that. Yeah. Anyway, next, what we got? Uh, is N22 PDF, who says, Great vid, Alex. Oh, thanks, so kind. I'm interested to see how the Van Riesel does in racing. I think they've done a great job. Um, not keen on the Villia paint job, much prefer the Cannondale. I prefer the Villia. I know you prefer the Cannondale. Yeah. I still love that Villia paint job. I do, it's not that I don't love it. I think the Cannondale has edged it a little bit for me. Yeah. But also, I think, it's, I think it's cool to see the Van Riesel. Someone was telling me it was the Van Rizzle. Van Riesel? Van Riesel? I think it's cool to see it in the World Tour. I think, I think, um, I yeah. think so, really cool. And um, yeah, it looks, it looks legit, doesn't it? Um, Byron says, thanks for coming to the TDU, Alex. It was a little thrill to bump into you. I was the guy that said, Alex, you're famous. <laughs> There you go. I'm amazed you got your name right. Yeah, I didn't even turn around, didn't know who was talking to. <laughs> um, user CX2BK6PM2F says, um, how can anyone, this is, this is under last week's tech show, by the way, oh, okay. where I, <clears throat> we were talking about how AI could change time trialling and make it boring. I, <laughs> I saw Cy, some of the show. Sai yeah. thinks time trialling's boring, right? This guy goes, how can anyone not be a fan of time trialling? Unlike team events where outcome depends on other people, time trialling is a poor, pure mano mano test and a true test of how cyclists rank against each other. Exactly. Yeah, I can get on board with it. It's and just at the a different moment, element. Alex ranks higher than me. No, I think I know you're in training, secret training. I know it. That's why you got your fresh haircut for today, more aero. Um, right, Gavin says, AI for bike fitting makes tons of sense. We love our Phil Burt's the world, but fitting can be expensive and time consuming. You could have a room with a treadmill surrounded by smart cameras and LiDAR sensors, have the rider pedal through a set regimen and let the AI make its suggestions. That actually would be really cool. Already exists, mate. <clears throat> oh. Seller Italia ID match. Actually, you got, that was a seamless link there. You got a video coming out soon. There is a video coming out very soon about <laughs> Seller Italia's ID match bike fitting, which is amazing. It has the power to fit you to any bike uh, you like and tell you exactly how to set it up without the bike actually being there. So you, you do it before you buy a bike and make sure you get the right size. It's amazing. Anyway, um, I'm really impressed by it. There's a, there's a vid coming, so make sure you subscribe and tune um, in. A couple one. of um, comments underneath the, I think it was about how wheel, wheels are designed. Yeah, so the yeah. Uh, Reynolds vid we did about, yeah, the yeah, how wheels are designed. And, and this question from um, You Know Base. <laughs> okay. Uh, it says, I'm curious about hubs and their influence on aerodynamics. I wonder why hubs aren't larger and there's no air dam at the centre of the wheels. So uh, this is something that not all brands take into consideration, but some do. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of brands just design a hub for uh, to be robust. A lot of brands just buy OEM hubs. So they'll buy, they don't make their own hubs, they buy a hub from, say, um, Hub well, Store. Another brand, so like... <laughs> yeah. Industry Nine, or they'll buy Chris King hubs or whatever. Yeah. Um, but brands have measured it and looked at it, and there and there is an impact. So if you look at like DT Swiss, their front hubs are really narrow. And that's very deliberate. That is there to help reduce just frontal area. It, it's a fraction difference, but it's deliberate. So you sort of take your choices on the design elements and what's most important, I guess. Yeah. Um, what else have we got here? So Ben says. Um, his wife's bike is a giant SLR1 with internal spoke nipples. Any wheel trim requires a tie off, rim tape off, which is a real world pitter pain in the ass. Yeah, yeah. I'm in complete agreement with that. Well, <laughs> it, it, but then it, not all internal nipples are equal, my friend. Oh, um, my God. Some are easier to work on than others. So, yeah, Cam, Campagnolo have a really good system for like. Mo is in the Momag. Um, Momag nipples. Momag nipples. So you don't have to take the rim tape off to do them. Yeah, and okay, that is a cool design. That is a cool design. Yeah, yeah. And um, also, how, how often do you actually end up having to adjust your nipples? Do you know what I mean? Well, 
Yeah, I don't I mean, know. The, the chances of a nipple adjustment being required at the a day after you've just installed a new tubeless tyre okay, is going to be, be very I'll low. be honest, I have not needed to true a wheel for a few years, yeah. at least, and I've ridden lots of different wheels and I've smashed into lots of holes. I'm going like six years, I've never <coughs> had to do it. Oh, well, yeah, I'll get you, six years. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyway. uh, that's it for comments of the yeah, week. fair point. <clears throat> yeah. Right. right, now it's the bike vault. Where is the bell? I've only been gone for a week and the bell's gone. Oh, it's over your side. Oh, hoard, hoarding the bell. Oh, thanks. Right, Please, I don't care. what have we got? Oh, so the bike vault, by the way, we need to remind people. Yeah, let's clear so, this up. Since the app is no more, we're back to the old uploader, but there's a link in the description below if you want to upload pictures of your bikes to be judged either nice or super nice, <clears throat> see if they get in the bike vault, and then Alex will ring the bell. The bike right. vault is the same, it's just a different path to get there. Yeah. They all channel into the same vault. Right, <clears throat> next, first up Mark, this week. with a number 22 drifter. Oh, do you know what? That's incredible! I'm rating that. How's that standing up? Um, I have no idea, but do you know what? I don't give a damn, because it looks sick. That is, Brown saddle. That is super nice, isn't it? That's out of this world. I am loving that. that <laughs> I'm is, so jealous of this bike. This, that is, yeah, we're in, I'm into that. Mark, you've done well. Super nice. Uh, next, we've got MJ. Do you think that's Michael Jackson? Yeah, I think he is. With a hat on tribound, RC520. Uh, <laughs> in Singapore? No, nah, he wouldn't be in Singapore. Right. Come on. Frame up against the post. Yeah. Get scratched. Not Don't into that. that. It's a shame, it's actually quite difficult to see the bike world because I think this bike has a lot of potential but I feel like we've not maximised it. It's a mega bike, the mm. RC520, yeah. but this is just too much gubbins going on, isn't there? That's saddle That's a nice. bike. It's a nice. Nice, I'm afraid. Or connects with a 2023 Canyon uh, Enduro Race. CF. Oh, yeah. Or, a, as Hank mistakenly called one the other day, an Enduro Race, an Endurance. Yes, I did notice that. Yeah. Hank, you can do better. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure he can. <laughs> um, right, the bike. Race one. This is in New York. What do you make of that? Cool story. I'm going to New York in a few weeks. Mm. Um, I really like it. Very small I'm bike. Going super nice on that. I know there's a bit of a like chimney going on, but I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt because you know you 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 measure you measure twice, you cut once. Just hmm. if you're not totally sure yet, just yeah. Engineering rule. Um, Mark next with a Bianchi XL. Pro 1998 Pantani team replica with some newer record components. Location at home. <laughs> oh. It's not in the big ring. No. But I'm a big fan of this kind of vibe and era of bike. I really like it. A lot of layback going on. <laughs> wow. That saddle, that is, is, that saddle is on the <laughs> limit. You can just be doing wheelies going along the road. Um, I, re I really want to let the rules slide here and say super nice just because it's blooming cool. And I like that era. Go on then. So we There's a lot of infractions, but come on, let's let's Thanks. bring some positivity to yeah. okay. January. Right, James with the DeRosa Merak Dura Ace NV SES 4.5 wheels. What's going on with the angle? It's making it look weird. Oh, nice. We can't let that slide. No. Is that like a chicken coop behind it as well? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Why are you taking a picture know. there? What? I think the chickens haven't escaped. Yeah. Okay. Um, right, then finally, um, last bike in this week's bike vault is my crit bike that I built up a few weeks back. This isn't necessarily the greatest picture of it, but I'm going to have a quick word with Isaac when he edits the texture and get him to find the absolutely sickest picture of the bike for this. Uh, okay. Um, but what do you think of the bike? Uh, uh, it's... I think on the basis that it doesn't have a Jura Ace chain set put on it, <laughs> that you just had lying around... Uh... <laughs> Never Whatever. letting it go. Oh, no, I Never don't. letting it go. I'm going to take that as no, a great. I think it's super nice. I think it's super nice. I want to say it's a super nice. I've got a lot of respect for this bike and like what it represents. And if you want to see Alex racing it oh, yeah, in a... some actual crits, yeah. make sure you subscribe because he took it to Australia all the way there and did some like pre-tour down under crits. Oh, cool story. The bike's still in Australia. I didn't bring it home. Why not? Uh, oh, I don't know how I'm getting it I home. forgot yet. it too much money to fly home with it. Did you forget it? No, I, I'll get it back, don't worry. I had to pay $1,900 to get my bike home. One of them, yeah. Why? Just bloody expensive. Uh, anyway, we won't dwell on that story. Um, <laughs> right, that's it for this week's tech show. 
Um, it's brilliant to be back. Please do check out all of the Tour Down Under content that I've worked really hard filming. So subscribe to GCN, subscribe to GCN Tech to make sure you don't miss out. And um, well, that's it for this week, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> See you in the next one. Bye. Love you, bye.